in that first revolution, we made a quantum leap in progress. Then came the next revolution. That next revolution would come at the beginning of last century. Largely the result of the work of a gentleman called Henry Ford. In a sense, in creating the moving assembly line, those things that man used power to produce could be brought together so much more quickly that the goods of the earth became available to many more people. Before, after the Industrial Revolution, goods of the earth began to be available, but only a small nobility were able to really use those goods of the earth. This is why, for example, the father of modern management, a man called Peter Drucker, who said before he died that if you look at Africa, you will find that at the beginning of the 20th century, the century just left, the quality of life of the average African and the quality of life of the average European is more or less similar. The nobility in Europe had, of course, much more. But the average person in Europe had a quality of life more or less at par with the average person in Africa. But as the 20th century moved to a close, the quality of life of the average African and the quality of life of the average European was like night and day. What happened in the 20th century? What happened in the 20th century was that during the 20th century, the average European learned to play God more in a man of speech, learned to produce more. Productivity rose dramatically because it brought technology together with uh, other things to facilitate output. And that beginning was the moving assembly line. Now, people talk about uh, the rise of the middle class, but how did the middle class rise? But what a government degree. The middle class rose from the pure pressures of capitalist experience. We talked about a report. He had invented the moving assembly line and was producing lots of things, but he was very arrogant about it. In fact, the most story told about because all the cars that were producing were model T ports. They were all black because the whole logic of mass production of the moving assembly line was to reduce cost by not very. So every car was black, but the default. So what does somebody say to Mr. Ford, Mr. Ford, sir, when shall we have a blue, a yellow, and a red T for the T? And Ford said, surely you can have whatever color you like, so long as it is black. Very <laughs> arrogant statement. But you know what? A group of automakers merged and they came to be known as General Motors. General Motors began to produce red Chevrolets, yellow, whatever other brands they had to do, these old mobiles and all of that. And Paul began to lose market share. Lose market share. Indeed, as some authorities argue, as World War II not come, the Ford Motor Company would have died. The coming of World War II then gave the business of the war effort. By then, uh, when Ford died, and his grandson became the chief executive and had a new mindset that's how Ford was saying. So, um, that revolution that spawned the growth in creativity created a mindset because what was important was mass production, but competition in business began to lead to specialization and market segments were being created, segmented markets, those who want zero ports, those who want this, 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 this. That revolution continued to drive the upward growth of the quality of life of man, which is why in the West the quality of life grew more dramatically than of Africa because we didn't have to do this kind of things. Africa. And then comes a small problem. Some people left out of this rapid development, like the Japanese, who had been written up completely. I was saying in the remarks I made to the lawyers uh, about two hours or so ago that there was a professor of economics at Harvard 
He gets the HDX Prize of his time in the 50s. His name was Edwin Reskala. Professor Reskala looked at Japan. He said Japan had no prospects of progress. But Japan's case was so bad that for those countries like Nigeria, it would be much more successful than Japan. Well, it was just a matter of years. Japan completely improved Reskala. As the Japanese ascended, and changes began to take place, competition, when I was living in the US in the 70s, suddenly big American corporations like Tapila began to lose market to uh, too much. And the company that the world to copy Xerox began to lose it to Canon. So, what is the market around the global new American Africa, American television crisis? A wonderful nice man was president of the United States at that time, but he didn't get it. In terms of economy, they were Jimmy Carter. And because Americans were losing jobs, inflation was double digits. In fact, in 1979, it was 29 percent. In the US, from President, it was 9 percent inflation. Very old man, who, in the opinion of many of my classmates, was already suffering dementia before he was elected, called Arena. <laughs> <laughs> they needed to be cut out in the election of 1980. To be cut out the actor, sorry, the, uh, the actor, was however a great performer. And he attracted some of America's finest conservative minds around him. And basically, the power to get to run America and make you see the world in London was sleeping, but went for the world was sleeping. In fact, World War III nearly started while he was sleeping. <laughs> the big clash on the Akil Doro affair in the Middle East, the Palestinians, and the American planes. Oh, he was sleeping when that happened. When he woke up from Riga uh, 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 and Riga, who went to the, the president, this is what happened that night. The hidden paper went to the camera and the light of Americans behind him. And he was sleeping when he woke up. That's what he actually was like. Even though he was sleeping, the job was done, and he was able to project himself as a president of the world. America's challenge severely when he put up, rose to his inspiration that in America everything is possible. And you know those who rose to that inspiration? It wasn't in a report that their grandchildren was 19 and 20 year old kids in college. When I was a graduate student in the US, you came to campus like around last month, you know, April, March, because the academic year simply ends in uh, May. Young people were working on their CVs, just like you, most of you are doing, looking for jobs that are not there. When I returned to Harvard a few years later, I was a basketball. Young people in America were not in March working on their CVs. They were working on their business plans. In general, they were working on their business plans. Reagan had inspired these young people and he created a brand new economy in the third revolution, the information technology revolution. Dot com revolution. The Silicon Valley of this world grows. California, the state of the United States, is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. And they are not that. Because of space technology or anything, they are that because of the investment process and the process, which created a small outpost just across the streets that we know today as Silicon Valley. Many of the chaps who in their dogs as master's degree students were figuring out some things, they gave people who made the Facebook of this world. So, what have they done simply because they simply responded to the call of the nation of the partners of the human nation. So you have an obligation, a holy duty to venture. If this country is going to be saved, it will not be saved by anybody that could be able to assure you. It's not going to be saved by Tony and Lulu, it will be saved by those of you in this room. But you have to believe in yourself. That is where the progress will come from. So what are the obstacles in the way of these things? 
One is that the biggest obstacle to this kind of progress is purpose. Finding their purpose. Many people don't find their purpose easy. That's how many of you have read the Reverend Rick Warren, the purpose driven life. Eh? Go and reflect on it. Find your purpose. It is also the first big challenge to doing business, which is self mastery. Uh, those who have been on the CBL uh, program know that the best secret is called self mastery. Back in those days, the Aristotle's and Plato's of this world, Socrates, they are what for man to know thyself. Unless you know yourself, unless you can fully understand the potential that is inside of you, given to you as a child of God, then you can accomplish. It is in taking that understanding of who you are, the fact that God gives generously his gifts, and there is none that is without his gift. But there are many who are able to discover what is understand. And you take that which is your gift. You know, that, you know, we have this for Joe McCarthy. Yeah. Now this guy is selling ice cream and making money. The next day everybody wants to sell ice cream. Whereas your gift is what will get you going now. Ah, this man is not in medicine. Everybody is not in medicine. I showed you there is no cost which you want. You understand the image, right? You are part of that, and you are making the image in reference to the image. Study history and take history. You ask yourself, that's why when can you see better people talk to vice chancellor about entrepreneurship? It's not about a class in entrepreneurship, it's about building entrepreneurship thinking into everything that is possible. So the person teaching history can teach, for example, that you can use history. So, for example, focus on family groups. And every family hires you to view your website that will take all the information about their great place, their grandfather's great place, their family, and family tree is there. All members who have come from that family anywhere they are in the world will log into that website and the family continues to engage on exchange in this That's the same story. Nobody told you to take one from this one. I'm telling you to be a millionaire from this one. Is having your entrepreneurial mindset. So, uh, if we master ourselves and we begin to move on, the next big challenge that we have is understanding the roadmap. The roadmap to where we are going. So we know where we are going. What's the roadmap? In doing this, we are dealing with two subject areas. One is strategy, what is called competitive strategy. The other, is really understanding the entrepreneurial process. Strategy basically is about asking yourself four questions. One, what kind of business do I want to go into? Because you cannot be all things to all people. You try to be all things to all people, you fail. So you tap in amongst the things that are before you, even within a, a segment that will just be back here. You cannot be a wholesale commercial bank at the same time as a retail, retail commercial bank. It's not possible. You are a market bank. <laughs> and you want to be a um, city bank. So that the big or guy who is overfed in the back of his Rolls Royce coming out like this, wrong thing to do in my mind, there on, but my man, Ledger or whatever, who is coming with the athletes in the room. One person will give way, or both will give way back. <laughs> the bank will be on its own. So you choose a particular kind of bank you want to be. That decision is called corporate strategy. When you make that decision, corporate strategy, your next big question is in this area of corporate strategy, how will I beat others who try to perform here? What unique thing will I offer? Is it in terms of my cost being very low? Is it in terms of my differentiating in a particular manner? That is called basic strategy. This is your basic strategy. You get your basic strategy. The question is, how do you align the various functions of that basic strategy? The person who is uh, 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 in human resources, the person who is in uh, operations, the person who is in finance. How do you ensure that what they are doing aligns to that basic strategy that we have agreed to? That's called functional strategy. And the fourth level is called institutional strategy. That is what I define you. 
than determining who we are. Invariably, a lot of studies have shown that the most competitive tool of a business enterprise are its values. Uh, to Paul McKinsey consultants wrote the book that will build last. What they discovered in their research that in companies that have been successful over long periods of time, the thing that has differentiated them has been their essential value system, the so called corporate culture. So, um, if you understand that, we get it together, the roadmap is going to be easier uh, to construct and therefore to lead to uh, use that to measure how you are going. The next thing is understanding the entrepreneurial process. Uh, in my book, Managing Uncertainty, I offer a frame for the entrepreneurial process, in which there are really three frames of activities in the entrepreneurial process. The first is essentially <coughs> discovering the opportunity. I call it opportunity conception. What is opportunity? That involves being able to see tomorrow of the day. How will the world look like? 50 years from now, if this great idea I have is implemented, that's the vision. When you get that done, and with that you go, I'm the one who can make that happen. If you're the one who can make that happen, then clearly you can go on. Then commercializing the venture. How do you do this thing in a manner that you can systematically, sustainably offer this thing and Get the value for what you have done. Involve the business plan, putting the resources together, determining how to work together, to use the, the resources to achieve that goal and your ambition. And the third part of it is called institutionalizing the venture. Because many times when you create this venture, it's not institutionalized. So you have code, business has a code. You somehow get admitted in the hospital, the business is common to us. God forbid that you should go and die. The business needs to be much more. So institutionalizing the best of venture involves taking standard operating procedures and teaching people to do it. I'm going to have to go, there's not much time, uh, so I'm going to just rush one or two things to say to you. The next critical thing that creates focus is the environment. There are many things in the environment of business. The politics, of our environment, the nature of our institutions. If there is uncertainty, you don't know what will happen tomorrow, business will be in trouble because people will stop it. Look, even look at our annual budgets. Two months before the budget, those companies stop ordering, they stop doing it because they don't know if the budget will bring the new law that will survive this year. Then after the budget has been announced, it takes about three months for us to get it. So in fact, where most countries have a 12 month cycle, and here they have a six month cycle, right? time before budget, the time after budget. These are our certainties that impact business. All those environments, kinds of things. Uh, you don't know if you start your farm, the next day, who are the will destroy it. I'm talking as one whose power has been destroyed by Black X Men. And this overarching uh, uh, um, really express uh, is, uh, um, So these are all the issues that you have to think about and how to, to deal with. Uh, so pros of institutions and all of that. Access to finance is the one people talk about the most. But it's not the most difficult problem. But finance usually is available if you get great ideas together properly. People who are contributing to the purposes. If your idea is what and you really can convince people about it, very few parts of the world are going to be able to do it. So, you will emphasize this access to finance problem. It is a problem, but it is not a big problem. Getting a great idea, developing the pipeline process, and then the access to finance issue is uh, what it is. Uh, and then, uh, managing people. We take it for granted, but the most difficult thing to manage in this world are people. With their big, uh, you know, idiosyncrasies, the day when you bring them all, his mother said, that person said, many businesses fail because managing people is a challenge. So, we have to learn to manage people. And it's business to manage people that we uh, build a competitive edge in many cases. Issues of market access. 
Yo les invito a ocupar la camión línea con el peso de la luz. La vida es más como el peso de la luz. La vida es más como el peso de la luz. Si tú puedes pensar, reflexionar, con el propio creativo en el mundo, para obtener estas cosas claras, no sé si tú puedes hablar de la vida. La vida es más como el peso de la luz. Um, I'm